Good morning and welcome to today's Electronic Design and Source Today webcast. Our topic today, the effects of long-term storage on semiconductor components, sponsored by Rochester Electronics. I'm Bill Wong, Senior Content Director with Endeavor's Design and Engineering Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply type your issue into the Ask Your Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the question mark help button in the upper right corner of the screen. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Electronic Design and Source Today websites within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let's meet today's speakers. Bill Brown is the Reliability Lab Manager at Rochester Electronics. He joined Rochester in 2011 as a quality engineer began the development of a reliability lab capable of qualifying hermetic and non-hermetic package devices. He has over 40 years experience in the manufacturing and reliability testing of semiconductor devices and packages. Peter Crudelli is the quality manufacturing manager at Rochester Electronics. He has over 20 years of manufacturing process and quality engineering experience in the electronics and defense industries. Now let me turn things over to our presenters. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm Bill Brown, another Bill. Um, I'd like to present our uh, beginning our webinar related to the effects of long-term storage on semiconductor components. You know, within this webinar, we'll discuss um, data collected on two papers that were written at Rochester Electronics. Um, th these are related to long-term effects, uh, focusing on component um, sortability, mechanical um, integrity, and in electrical testing. Uh, initial agenda will be trends of um, semiconductor manufacturing and life cycles options for extending components available, availability, key areas of concern with long-term storage components use, uh, results of um, testing performed, and uh, at the end, we'll have a summary questions and answers session. So just a little background um, on the industry. Um, as you can see in the pie chart on the left, you know, government automotive in industry and in industrial um, consumer components in communications are driving the market share of components. Um, the plot on the right side shows um, industry components and um, automotive um, components and also automotive components are also in that grouping of um, programs that will have long-term uh, life cycles. So um, also industry trends toward um, shorter life cycles. So, so most of the industry has gone to um, satisfy in, you know, that group of commercial component and um, trying to get components to market quicker. So the traditional production cycles and end of life cycles have been much um, reduced over recent times. So, um, Sorry, I go to the slide first. Um, one of the ways the Rochester Electronics um, is addressing this is, uh, you know, they, they maintain components for a longer period of time than most people do. They extend the life by acquiring IP and continuing the manufacturing of components. Uh, they stock um, components so that after manufacturing for a longer period of time to, you know, re you know, stretch out this life cycle that's um, being compressed by industry needs. Um, options for extended continuous twin continuation of supply, um, long time buys in in-house long-term storage. You know, those are things that um, our customers can do on their own. You know, pros are the ability to obtain and require a number of components um, directly from the supplier. 
key issues there, though, are you know, it's very expensive to buy all those components up front and, uh, you know, acquire an expertise on the storage of those components and maintaining them uh, for that long life cycle is, you know, cumbersome. Um, you know, long-term products uh, needs uh, large um, initial investment also for that um, endeavor. So s some other options, uh, you can purchase long-term term storage components from authorized distributors, you know, like Rochester Electronics, uh, Pro's ability to acquire components in a cost-effective manner. Um, you know, those po components that uh, need to ensure components are um, authentic, um, you know, we're only using authorized suppliers, uh, use of authorized suppliers only, concern about quality performance in age components. Uh, so proper storage uh, requirements are necessary. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Peter Cordell. He will be going over the two papers that were created in the um, detailed data analysis of those papers. Peter? You muted. I was unmuting, but uh, okay. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking your taking time out of your day to uh, to attend our webinar. Um, I will be taking time to discuss common concerns associated with age components, ranging from date codes, tin whiskers, uh, component um, lead oxidation, solderability, mechanical integrity, as well as electrical performance. Um, we'll also be highlighting the work performed by my colleagues, as well as referencing guidelines and studies by OCMs. Semiconductor date codes originated in the 1940s when there was a, a gap in um, both processes and materials. The introduction of date codes provided traceability for the process of record and bill of materials on a, on a given component date code. This also ended up being used by several standards and contractual flowdowns to restrict procurement of devices. Uh, an example of such is MIL PRF 38535, which had required components over three years of age to be electrically validated uh, prior to use. This was revisited in 1995 and removed from the standard. The requirement at that point in time was that components are solderable. Similarly, uh, MIL PRF 19500 uh, talks to acquisition documents should not restrict the procurement of devices based on date code. Following up in 2002, uh, a task force, uh, NIDA, uh, which had key players from TI, ADI, and Freescale, uh, concluded that process improvements have uh, eliminated uh, failure mechanisms related to component age, and that they recommended that consumers did not limit procurement based on date code. I'm assuming most of the folks on the call are, are familiar with tin whiskers and that they apply to more than tin. They apply to tin alloys as well as the alloys of other metals. And that they're, they're crystalline structures that can grow in excess of several millimeters and have the potential to, to cause electrical shorting. Uh, NASA's done a lot of studies on um, tin whiskers and you can find a lot of information on their, their homepage. But a couple of key notes that they've concluded is that a single accept, accepted explanation um, of the mechanisms has not been determined and that the growth rate is highly variable and dependent on a complex relationship of, of factors. In this image in the lower left hand side here, we can see uh, a lead with a, with a tiny little tin whisker. If tin whiskers are a concern, there is always the option to uh, solder dip the, the components to a tin lead uh, 6337 or 6040 dip. Um, you know, you may be limited in your package and lead pitch. Um, solder dipping, the thickness is a lot greater than a plating, so it may not be feasible in all cases. Um, Rochester Electronics does have in-house soldering capabilities. Uh, additionally, if we were to, to build a device from dye out of our extensive dye bank, uh, there would be other lead finish options uh, available.
On, the, on these next few slides, I am going to briefly discuss the, some of the methodologies and, and tools used in both our study, uh, as well as some of the papers that we'll be referencing. Rochester Electronics has surface mount and dip and look solderability capability, as well as MSL characterization capability. We are DLA certified for MIL standard 883, test method 5004 screening and 5005 QCI. We routinely perform uh, testing to JEDEC standards in accordance with JSD 47. Uh, and we plan to have internal gas analysis in-house by the end of the year. Some of the, the FA tools that we'll be discussing briefly uh, is um, scanning electron microscope or, or SEM, uh, X-ray decapsulation and cross-sectioning. We have all these capabilities in-house though for the purpose of our study, we decided to uh, con subcontract out that work uh, to address concerns of, of bias. These are the same FA tools that we use in our device recreation process as well. When we get to our, our test plan, um, the last item in there will be electrical test. Uh, this comes into play because Rochester has 16 um, different automated test equipment or ATE platforms that allows us to test uh, a variety of technologies from digital to analog, mixed signal, uh, over a wide range of package outlines and pin counts uh, across the temperature range of minus 60 C to 200 degrees C. We also maintain internal engineering for uh, board design and repair. So getting into our evaluation plan, uh, we looked at three main areas, starting with solderability. And for the solderability aspect, we populated a, a FR4 PCB with age components. We then took those age components as part of our mechanical integrity analysis. And then finally, we performed uh, electrical performance testing to data sheet limits. This image on the right is a, a layout of the uh, PCB that we used in our assembly process. So in our solderability testing, we used a solder paste reflow. This is gonna be different from some of the other papers or studies that you may be familiar with, uh, in which they've used, either used wetting balance or the JEDEC S1 method. Um, <clears throat> we tried to best represent the end use of our, our consumers and with FR4 board, which is the most common type of board out there. So it, it best represents real-time use. Uh, we covered a variety of packages from PLCCs, TSOPs, um, SOICs, and these components aged from three to 16 years. And we covered a wide variety of lead finishes as well, matte tin, nickel palladium gold, uh, as well as uh, solder plate. We utilized an independent test lab in assembly house uh, to perform the population of the, the PCB. It was a typical lead-free profile with a peak temp of a 245C. And uh, the normal time to the oven was about four and a half minutes. So you can see a, a graphical representation of the, uh, the profile that was used here. Looking at the solder joints, um, this device is a 28 PLCC with a, a matte tin lead finish. On the left-hand side, we, we see the SEM image that displays good wetting and filleting up the, the leads. This passes IPCA 610 requirements. Across the pad, it is greater than uh, two lead widths. And, and up the fillet heel, it is greater than the thickness of the lead plus the solder. So again, this is acceptable to IPCA 610. The X-ray on the right shows consistency along that edge of the device in the wetting. Uh, this is exactly what we'd expect to see. Um, and there is no indication that component age negatively impacted the solderability of these devices. Another device is a, a 14 lead TSOP. This actually has a nickel palladium gold lead finish. 
And again, the uh, the filleting is is robust and passes IPCA 610 requirements. Across the pad, it's greater than three times the lead width, and up the heel, it is greater than the, the lead thickness plus the solder height. Uh, and it doesn't extend up into the um, the shoulder of the lead. The X-ray on the right shows consistency across the individual leads on a given side for filleting. So again, reiterating the fact that component age did not negatively impact solderability. Uh, and these two devices were in the, the four to 16 year range. Um, so that just is an indication of uh, no impact of oxidation or any other type of variable that would negatively impact the devices to solder. The independent test lab that we used looked at a variety of things. They x-rayed each individual component. They inspected to IPCA 610 requirements. They also used automated uh, inspection or AOI. Uh, and then they did a final board inspect. Uh, they did not detect any defects and inspection to all industry standards for board mount um, showed no issues. So the takeaway here is components that were aged up to 16 years soldered with, with no issues to uh, what represents a, a real-time application of, of the user. On the mechanical integrity side, we took some of the components that were populated on the PCB and performed laser decapsulation, uh, x-ray, SEM, and cross-sectioning. Uh, again, for this, we used an independent test lab. Uh, these components range from four to 14 years and included matte tin, nickel palladium gold packages, uh, PLCC, TSOPs, VSONs. Here is the cross-section analysis of a TSOP. Uh, this device was 14 years old at time of testing. The image on the left-hand side is an X-ray. Uh, we see no indications of any issues with the, the wire bond. Everything looks robust. The image on the right, uh, again, shows good filleting for the solder reflow, um, acceptable to IPCA 610 requirements. Furthermore, there is no sort of indication of any delamination in the package, whether it be from the lead frame to the mold compound, uh, whether it's to the die to the mold compound or the, the paddle as well. Even along the die attached to the mold co compound, there is no indication of any sort of delamination. So uh, again, component age did not impact mechanical integrity of these devices. These are behaving exactly like we would expect them to. This is a, a PLCC. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see the X-ray image of the wire bonds. Again, no defects. Uh, everything looks just as it should. No signs of lifting or, or any other associated concerns. Now, the SEM image, SEM image on the right is more of a close-up than the previous one. But again, we don't see any signs of delamination at any of the interfaces. Um, the dye attached to mold compound is solid. The dye to the mold compound is solid. Uh, same thing with the paddle. Uh, the wire bonds do not show any indication of, of lifting or any other sort of wire bond defect. So I'll say it again, but uh, <laughs> component age did, did not impact the mechanical integrity here. Uh, and this device was a representative of 13 years old. Further in the construction analysis, we looked at post encapsulation die and wire bond. On the left-hand side, you can see a gold ball bond on a um, pad. There is no indication of any sort of lifting or wire bond defects as a result of component age. Furthermore, on the right-hand side, the, uh, the SEM image uh, doesn't show any signs of delamination off the wire to the mold compound, uh, nor is there any indication of issues with the, the ball bond to the, the pad. So again, component age did not impact um, mechanical integrity in a negative way. The, the final leg of our study involved electrical testing. Now, this is going to vary greatly from the other studies that you may have 
read or referenced, but um, that could be due to a, a multitude of issues. Those OCMs or manufacturers may not have that test program available anymore. Also, the, the test platform may not be available anymore. Um, you know, that's a common occurrence with the, the shortened cycle time of devices, you know, especially when these devices in this electrical testing range from three to 17 years. When you think of what the actual cycle time is these days on components, it's much, much shorter. But we looked at three components with two date codes per component. Um, we, we varied the technology. One was a digital controller. Another one was a one-time programmable memory. And the, the last one was an analog linear regulator. Um, you can see here they cover a wide variety of lead finishes from matte tin to nickel, palladium gold, and solder plate. And they all yielded 100% to their data sheet limits. So we've already gone through and recapped that solderability is not impacted by component age for our samples. The mechanical integrity was not impacted by component age. And now we've gone through and validated that electrical performance was not impacted by component age. I'd like to, at this point, talk to some handling guidelines um, and papers issued by various OCMs, the first of which is uh, Allegro Microsystems, which in 2019 released handling storage guidelines for semiconductor devices. In these guidelines, they took matte tin components that were stored at ambient conditions for, for 10 years, and they performed uh, wetting balanced with uh, SAC-305 immersion, uh, and they concluded that the long-term stability uh, was not impacted uh, for solderability. They also indicated that the oxidation that was accumulated did not impact solderability either. Texas Instruments has also released multiple papers, the, the first of which in 2008 took device components that were aged up to 15 years and they evaluated them for solderability, SEM, MSL characterization, as well as decapsulation uh, and visual inspection. What they determined is that the solderability of the long-term storage devices performed just as well as current devices and that there was no degradation of MSL performance. In 2021, they had a follow-up paper that expanded the type and variety of packages they looked at, uh, as well as performing solderability testing to the, the JEDEC S1 method, which soldered to a ceramic plate. Their determination there was that there was no evidence of diminished reliability as a result of components being in long-term storage. And the most interesting note in that paper is their statement of TI will eliminate limitation on storage durations. So there is a major OCM that, that makes that statement based on the data that they've collected regarding age components. So it, it highlights the, the fact that, you know, just because a component is aged doesn't mean it can't meet uh, the consumer's needs. At this point in time, I will turn the webinar back over to Bill Brown. Okay, thank you, Peter. Get my slide up here. Okay, so, so in summary, some of the um, items um, consider, uh, you know, purchase of authorized uh, distributors, purchase from authorized distributors, and in effect to obtain a, and mitigate against any unknown handling storage um, found outside the authorized chains. Uh, you know, a good understanding is um, date code um, uh, restrictions, you know, two to three years for manufacturing date uh, are not good indicators of the quality and reliability of components that um, may be um, provided by um, suppliers that, um, provide parts from authorized distributors. Uh, Rochester Electronics has produced a um, detailed analysis of solderability, mechanical integrity, electrical performance um, for components stored up to 17 years. No issues or failures were detected um, during this study. 
Multiple OEMs have um, conducted detailed analysis of components stored. Um, you, know, you saw the TI paper, I think that was 17 years on, under controlled environments and um, conducted that um, components can be used um, up to 21 years. Um, that, that's just based on a study, you know, could be longer. So, so at this time, I'll um, pass it back to Bill Wong, who will um, you know, moderate our question and answer session. Thank you. A few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. If you'd like to submit a question, type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit the Send button. Also, please take a moment to complete the feedback form, which will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. So to start with, what mitigation options exist to prevent tin whiskers? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, some industries have found that, you know, adding uh, lead to their solder um, configuration will deter tin whisker formations. Um, that's a primary objective. I, I think a lot of it's still unknown in the industry, what uh, causes the formations. Um, so that's, um, there's, there's a good um, article out there, a good document, um, uh, JP002 um, from JETIC and IPC that um, go into some of these details and they, and they have some very good um, reference documents within that document for the industry to um, research. Okay, I have some more tin whisker questions here. Uh, so I'll combine them. Did any of the components have tin whiskers and are tin whiskers associated with long-term storage? I don't believe in any of the documents I've read that the tin whiskers are directly associated with the life of the component. Um, storage environments could be factors. There's a lot of unknown. Um, the components that we use uh, prior and post inspection did not show any tin whisker formation from our stock. Okay. Um, I assume the components tested were stored in proper storage requirements in, uh, in the uh, examples? You know, all the components um, were out of our warehouse in industry standard uh, storage um, conditions, environmental conditions. And for the most part, uh, either OEM manufactured, um, and those would have been in the original manufacturer's uh, packing material. You know, others that Rochester manufacturers would be in their own packing materials. So what were the uh, storage conditions? You know, I think you just did part of them, but uh, what about the rest of the details? Yeah, it, it, it varies. Um, you know, we, we do acquire components that have come to us from, um, you know, they might have been in a distributor location and come to us from the original manufacturer. Um, but it's um, typically standard industry standard um, temperature and humidity environment. Okay. There's no it, nitrogen environment. Is it better to store wafers or packaged ICs? Uh, personally, uh, my opinion is, you know, as long as you keep it in the wafer form and you maintain that properly and don't um, obtain any corrosion on the bond pads, that material will last much longer. Um, you know, we've seen wafers up to when they began, you know, 50 years um, that we still have in our stock that can be used. Do you plan to continue this test uh, for other package types or solder types such as BGAs and so on? Yeah, we, we have a new um, initiative, uh, another paper to be um, finished, uh, you know, data collection for 2023 that will be covering some of the other technologies in uh, larger packages, uh, BGAs. Um, you know, we, we want to understand, um, you know, most of these were smaller packages, you know, there's some PLCCs, but we, we want to understand, you know, what does the form factor do? You know, you have more material there that could um, change over time. So we're going to be focusing on higher pin count components and um, surface mount devices in our next paper. Is there a certification or documentation from the supplier uh, that would assure optimal storage conditions? 
Well, there are, there are a number, and I can't reference them here, but there are a number of documents in the industry that um, recommend um, storage uh, conditions for components, and we could provide that information on the um, feedback. Um. Does Rochester offer wafer storage services? Rochester does offer wafer storage services. We have um, two very large um, wafer storage um, facilities and those components are stored in nitrogen uh, environments for the most part. We have been doing some research also in um, wafer storage, um, what is best industry practices and, and what can we do to, you know, we want to maintain that silicon for, you know, 50, 75 years, you know, as long as we can. And, you know, like I said, we have a lot of very aged um, silicon in our stock that, you um, maintained properly is not showing any degradation. So yes, we do offer that um, service. Okay. What IPC class solder joints are you measuring? Uh, Peter, could you handle that one? I yeah, absolutely. You to me about that, yes. Yeah. So the independent lab that we used uh, reported out to class two uh, looking at the requirements of, of class three in, in the images, um, the determination is that they would pass class three as well. At least, at least for what we looked at in our study. Okay. Based on your findings, is it a correct conclusion that you would affirm that storage of the components for up to 10 years and then in the field usage for another 10 years is a reasonable expectation of performance? Yes, definitely. That that should be an expectation for any supplier. Um, you know, as long as components are stored properly, uh, we've seen components that were not stored properly and they can degrade. But um, if they're stored properly and maintained, uh, there should be no impact to the customer. What do you do if uh, you have oxidation on bonding pads on the die before wire bonding? As long as, long as the bond pad is not degraded and corroded, you can do a, a plasma clean on the bond pads. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We have a whole bunch of questions still, but we'll have to get back to you okay. via yeah. email on those. Me and Peter will be available for any questions. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yep. And thank you, everyone, for attending today and uh, spending your, your time with us. Yes, thank you. This concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design and Source Today, I'd like to thank Rochester Electronics for sponsoring today's event and, of course, to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.